why don't you tell the viewers the real reason you got into fitness and don't give them, don't give them the like, oh, I just wanted to be healthier thing. Like what was the real reason? Bienvenue au podcast Quantum, le podcast numéro un sur l'entraînement, l'alimentation et le mindset pour devenir la meilleure version de toi-même. Sans plus attendre, voici votre hôte, Jacob Amel. Salut tout le monde, bienvenue au podcast Quantum. Aujourd'hui, c'est pas moi, c'est Coach William qui va prendre le relais pour une interview avec Vince Pitstick, le Metabolic Mentor. Euh, c'est un gars qui a vraiment un paquet de connaissances, c'est vraiment incroyable. Euh, c'est un nutritionniste fonctionnel, il est fondateur de Nutrition Dynamics, c'est une des plus grosses compagnies de coaching santé euh, aux États-Unis, puis il coach des gens de plein de background, mais surtout euh, des gens qui ont fait de l'Olympia, qui ont fait des compétitions de fitness, puis de, de réoptimiser leur, euh, leur métabolisme, leur corps, leur santé et tout ça. Donc, sans plus attendre, je vous laisse avec William et Vince pour le podcast. I just want to start off with uh, just a little bit of your background, who you are, how you became uh, the metabolic mentor in the industry of fitness and what got you into it. Sure, yeah. Um, so yeah, hello everybody. I'm uh, Vince Pitstick. I'm a functional nutritionist, uh, certified personal trainer. Before there was health coaching, there was something called first line therapy. Um, I, got, I got into the industry before health coaching, nutrition coaching became real popular. There was only like clinical nutrition. Um, and then there was bodybuilding. There really wasn't this space of fitness nutrition. Uh, it really didn't exist yet. And um, it was really when macros um, just started kind of hit the scene too. And uh, so there was a certification and things you can go through in the medical system called a first line therapist. So that was my, that was my first certification uh, in the world of like clinical nutrition per se. And, and anyway, so, um, uh, I, uh, I worked with a lot of different doctors over the courses of 10 years while also being a, a prep coach and a personal trainer, advanced my education. And then, you know, um, went to work as a functional medicine consultant. So I worked with a company that is pretty popular there in Canada and here in the United States. Uh, sorry, there's people outside as usual, like working on the lawn. So if you can hear them, I apologize in advance. <laughs> That's just how it always goes. Uh, but uh, so, and I started working with um, some, some bigger names. I got to train under doctors like Dr. Mark Hyman, um, Je Dr. Jeffrey Bland, Joel Evans, um, and others, and learn how to blend the craft of like every daily, what I, what I would say goes from fitness nutrition into what we call functional nutrition, which I call today which I didn't know what I was doing at the time, but I was making what, what would be the modern day hybrid coach. And so then I opened my own practice um, about eight years ago called Nutrition Dynamic. And uh, it is now the largest uh, health coaching company in the United States. Uh, from that process, I had to develop a way of replicating myself. The, the pressure was too big. I was burning out. I couldn't see everybody. And we had to find a way to replicate me. And I came up with... Um, the Metabolic Mentor University in order to train internal coaches on how to be the best in the world. And uh, from that process now, um, we've got a, a university, it's invite only at this point, but we're gonna go public. So I guess um, I'm kind of releasing some of that information here for the first time. Um, we're gonna go public here very soon, but it's it's this blend of the hybrid coach, meaning that you know fitness, you know, you know standard macronutrition, uh, you know how to you know work people out, you know those things, but Now you add in the, 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 the science behind functional medicine, where, where, where we've come in functional research over the last 30 years, and then a blending those applied sciences together to create massive outcomes in clients and clients in the future. And so um, my goal as an individual before I die is to change the way that health is delivered and to use health coaches and nutritionists and turn them into this hybrid coach as a first line defense against chronic disease in the you know northern hemisphere oh that's great i really and that's why i fell in love with the content you put out because i was watching it i got i think uh i stumbled across your uh, platform because of my coach uh, alan kress because i think uh, you're one of his mentors if i'm not mistaken yes, uh, so alan kress and there's certain businesses that i help grow now so i don't just work with coaches i work with companies To help grow their platforms the way that I've been able to grow mine and, and, and help them get through some of the challenges of scaling like a service business. Um, and, and I do that with the, uh, the help of my, 
my, my PIC, my partner in crime, uh, Will Webb, he owns a company called Lead Strategy, which helps companies scale. He's, and he's really good at it. He's not one of these fly by night uh, companies that really doesn't know what they're doing. He really knows this stuff. And uh, so now we scale businesses. And one of them that I scale is Alan Crest. So he's one of my private mentees. Um, from my university, you can actually be a private apprentice. And so Alan's that, and uh, Alan's a rock star. Alan's and Alan and, and Jason Theobald, and a lot of these other coaches that are following out from underneath them, um, are a lineage that I'm very, very proud of. Because when I'm done, I'm going to have a lot of them, and I think if there's enough of us changing the conversation, that we can change the industry. And and then if we change the fitness industry, and we get big enough, the health industry will have to listen. And that's that's what we're finding is true. And so, you know, uh, that's where I'm heading because I believe that fitness coaches are the key to unlocking health and, and any outcome, but we cannot be boxed in this corner where it's just like, oh, I'm here to help, you know, get someone's back stronger, uh, you know, or, or help them, you know, lose five pounds or help build a little bit of muscle. Those are important aspects of what we do. And don't get me wrong. It's valuable. And if that's what you do as a coach right now, I'm not here to minimize that. It's extremely important, but along the journey, we can be more, you know, I think coaches are the modern day practitioner and we need to, we need to bring them into the 21st century. And that's what I'm going to do. That's great. I love it because I see that a lot when people, when clients come to my office and they're like, I have this problem, that problem and whatnot. And when they go to their doctors, I don't want to say all doctors are bad or they're just a, uh, they just prescribe pills, but a lot of times they're just going to say like, oh, you don't uh, like, you can't go to the bathroom, just take this pill and it's going to fix your problem. But there's a lot of things we can do just by changing your nutrition, your sleep patterns, uh, your, uh, how you manage your stress and other things in your, in your life in general. And oh. that's a big problem I see. And especially with women, I feel like it's, the biggest problem because and especially in the fitness industry because these girls they don't have their periods for long periods of time and when they go see a doctor some of them are going to say it's normal or some of them are going to say oh just change the pill change your pill take another one instead and how do you see that when doctors just prescribe pills over pills over pills like do you see a problem with that or yeah, so really good. You're you're asking some great questions here, and you're you're and you're looking at some things where 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 there's this divergence occurring. Um, and I can say this both to your Canadian um, viewers and you know any of your viewers in the United States. Um, when you go down this allopathic road of medicine, so what is an allopath? That's the first question that everyone should be asking themselves. That is a doctor that is that is uh, trained in the healing modality of prescriptions and procedures, okay? They are not an oracle. They do not know everything. They don't know nutrition. They don't know fitness. They don't know everything. They're just human beings that have gotten a license to practice medicine in a specific area. And that medicine entails procedures and pharmaceutical approaches to wellness, if we place it in the, in the basket that it's supposed to be in, medicine makes sense. But when medicine starts to try to answer everyday chronic functional issues, they fail to hit the, re the things that actually cause it. And so they don't really do a good job. And yet patients and people are told to go to them for every problem that they have. And that's, I think, the biggest problem of all. And then, and then not to mention the more that you clamp down, um, like what I find, um, take like different medical government structures, like the difference between Canada and the United States. Our, our Canadian clients suffer so much more because there's less options because of the way things are kind of set up. And so they're either stuck with waiting to get into some doctor and then only being able to do what that doctor wants or trying to go to a naturopath that's going to charge them uh, like in a ridiculous amount of money. And it's a tough gig. And we still have the same problems here in the United States. And I'm not suggesting either medical systems better. I think they're both flawed, right? Um, yeah. But, but the, the, the challenge is, is that when you keep trying to use medicines to solve a functional problem, 
you start running into other medical complications. You know, death by medications and medication side effects really represent either the top nine or, or, the, or the number eight leading cause of death in, in either country, by the way. <clears throat> the average American is on, at 50 years old is on three to five medications. Um, and all that carries with it a cost. We think medications are free and that's the danger. Uh, every medication has a cost. It doesn't matter what it is. I don't care how good it is for you. Now, some beat the cost benefit analysis, like it's, it's worth the con, but there's always a con. And, and, and so, you know, I don't know how it is in Canada, but in the United States, pharmaceutical companies are allowed to direct market to consumers, um, where being that we get, we get drug commercials every five minutes telling us what drug we should take. Yeah. And I, I think that should be illegal. We, we're not allowed to promote um, cigarettes to children. We're not, a, you know, we should not be promoting fast food to children. We still are. Ronald McDonald is still prevalent in the United States. And, and then we're also allowed to tell them what disease they have and to go tell their doctor this is what they have. And then doctors are left just to prescribe them whatever they want to keep them as patients. And so you've got this, the, we're, we're making our own bed and we're having to lay in it. And the, comp the population is actually getting sicker. And if you want to look at it from a population perspective, in these last three to five years will be the first time in human history that the generation after, uh, like, so if you take, um, if you take our generation, so I'm, you know, I'm at 36 and up. So if you take our generation, so if you take any generation that's 10 or below, okay. That will be the first generation in human history to not have a median age longer than its parents or its grandparents. So, so, you, so you get to a point where you can no longer plug the leaks with medications and you start seeing, and then, and then not to mention all the other issues that we see, the, the rapid increases in fertility issues and blood sugar issues and cancers and, and, uh, yeah, uh, you know, uh, autoimmune diseases, and you start looking at the patterns, and then you start looking at human behavior, and it's very obvious the trends. Yet the medical system is unable to attack those things correctly because they're not trained in it. They never were. That's not their job, right? That there was never they, they didn't go to school for fitness, nutrition, and how to heal people internally and make psychological improvements and physical improvements in their health which are the root causes of these problems that you cannot fix with a pill. And so that's, that in, entails the problem, right? Um, so, so that's the challenge that we face, but wherever there's challenge, because I'm, I'm an opportunist and I'm, I'm all about positivity, where there's a challenge, there is an opportunity. So when you see failing health across any type of Americanized system, so you know, even look at the rates of health in Canada, you, and it's, it's a little bit better there because you guys don't adopt all of our practices, but a lot of them. Uh, the American way of life is, is kind of cancerous, I'll be honest with you. Con capitalism, consumerism are, while I love them in many ways because it, it brings me my Amazon to my doorstep every day, uh, it also causes disease because it makes us isolate, it makes us you know, eat fast food, it makes us depressed, we're on social media all the time, and, and we're not moving, right? So uh, that was, it spreads across the modern world. We look at rates of illness in India now. China, um, Russia, you start seeing that when our way of life spreads into someone else's world and takes over their culture, uh, it's a sickening thing. And I hate to say that, but it just is. And the thing is, though, boring up from that, this illness is this world of fitness, right? That's trying to go the other direction. They're saying, I don't want that life. I want to be healthy. I want to look healthy. I want to feel good. And there's all these coaches sitting around fighting over the same 10 fitness clients. The problem with fitness clients is most of them have body dysmorphia. They're overdoing it to make themselves unhealthy. A lot of the things that we do in fitness actually hurt people. The fitness industry has not had the answers for the medical problem because we still see the rates of all conditions going up despite the growth of the fitness industry. The fitness industry is like an $8 billion industry at this point. Uh, and yet it doesn't matter. Um, you know, it, it's still, it's still causing, it's not helping the collective good. And so that's where, you know, this, this hybrid world is going to be born. And mark my words, 
five to 10 years from now, all you'll know is functional coaching. People, people will go to a functional coach uh, like they would go to a personal trainer or like they would go to their primary care doctor um, to solve most common issues that Americans face today. And you talk about the, the fitness industry, because I think in general, the fitness industry is a movement that started maybe, I think I was in high school when it started to become really popular, all the men's physique guys and all that stuff came, uh, came up. I think it's great in some point because it made, it started, people started moving from that movement, but at the same time, people try to, uh, do the same thing as like professional athletes in the IFBB and things like that when they just want to get in shape. So like this yeah. uh, girl who's in love with fitness and whatnot, she starts doing things that people on the Olympia stage are doing. And yes. it's two different things. Like bodybuilding, I think is an extreme sport. You have to do extreme things to get to where you want to be. But when people in just the general fitness are start doing these, these things, that's where the problem is because they go on like really low uh, calorie diets and they start yeah. doing cardio like crazy. Yeah. And after like seven, eight months of doing it, they start experiencing like uh, the gut, gut issues, uh, all their sleep issues. Got it. And yeah. so let, let you make a great point. So let's go ahead and break down for the listeners and viewers um, what the, the probably the five most um, uh, missed things about the fitness bodybuilding lifestyle that end up actually doing the reverse to you. So a lot of people will find fitness because they're looking for a way to live. They don't particularly like themselves. Well, let's get honest on, let's get honest on the air right now. Why don't you tell the viewers the real reason you got into fitness and don't give them, don't give them the like, Oh, I just wanted to be healthier thing. Like what was the real reason? Honestly, I started training because I was playing basketball in high school. Then I stopped. And so I was like, I need to do something. And I'm like this little shy guy. So in high school, I was like, man, I'll start training because all the other guys were uh, working out yes. and they had big muscles. So I was like, man, like the girls are going to like it. So I'll That's just start it. working out. So there's yeah. always this deep, uh, deep reason why you start uh, working out. I, right? I love it. You didn't even, I didn't even have to fight you for it. That's why you're, you're, a, you're, a, you're a solid person. Cause like, I didn't have to fight you for the truth. You weren't uncomfortable telling your truth. Like most people are like, like for me, um, I had a lot of injuries in sports and sports were the thing that initially made me feel like a tough kid, like a, like a, Uh, value. I got my, um, my intrinsic value from my, my family, my friends and my athletic ability. And when that was taken from me with multiple knee injuries, I had no identity and I didn't really like myself. And I, I got into the gym because one day I think girls said that they liked my abs, but I noticed I didn't have it. That, that, that's when I started really identifying with my body And I realized I didn't have a chest or arms or any of these things. And then I saw some of these other guys and I'm like, you know, maybe I should, you know, maybe I could work out more and it would change some things. I didn't know anything about what I was doing at the time. Um, and then when I got in there, it gave me my first sense of real confidence as I got, as I got good at it. And it gave, it showed me that I could be consistent and go after something that I really wanted that wasn't just school related. And then it started giving me self-confidence. Now, I think it was a false sense of confidence because later on, I think it, it overtook me. I went too far with it, which is exactly what we're going to talk about with fitness. When we talk about guides, fitness coaches need to stop. There's an indemnity in medicine. So like, if you go see a doctor, a doctor's supposed to have taken an oath that thou shall do no harm. I don't think they follow that oath very well. It's a Hippocratic oath or whatever. And in coaching, coaches should have to take an oath. They don't, but they should. Because your real responsibility to somebody is not getting them the outcome. It's about creating an experience, developing a relationship, and training a process. That's why on my wall, I don't think you can see it here, it says process over progress. Yeah. Because if I give you progress without process, I did not do my job. So if you lose 15 pounds, but then don't know where your, your way back to healthy eating and how to balance things out and maintain it. I failed you because my primary responsibility is not outcomes. I'm a guide. 
I'm a trusted servant. I'm a guide. And if I don't guide your mind while I guide your body, I have failed. And so the problem is, is that I had a lot of great coaches along the way, but they, were, they, they failed their oath. They didn't guide me correctly. They told me what the fastest way to do whatever is without guiding my mind. They didn't slow down, teach my mind. So I got into a lot of the wrong things and I got into comparison and I got into not being enough and I fed into it. And so for me, a lot of the unhealthy aspects of fitness came out that I've had to fight. You know, even one of them was the way that I used to train because I was training. I was, I got so big at one point, you know, I was like 230, 240. I'm like, I don't know, 198 now. And the way I was training so heavy irresponsibly, but I was with around a lot of, a lot of power lifters. Then the power lifters were all taking insulin, steroids, and Twinkies. And uh, now that's not what I did, but I didn't do the Twinkies um, and I didn't do the insulin, uh, but I did everything else. And I, and I left it irresponsibly. And I'm still with dealing with some of those injuries today. Um, and I had to fight and fix a lot of the thing, the damage that I did to myself in bodybuilding. So you see inevitably by trying to be healthy and get some self-respect, I caused all these, self, these problems for me. This is what happens to most women too um, in the sport and some men. And it's because the number one thing I said, the top five things that I think happen in the fitness industry is the first thing is we don't guide the mind. If you've got a client in front of you, or if somebody comes looking to you for help, you have a unique opportunity to change that person's life. If you don't take that seriously, I don't know if you can cuss on these podcasts, so I apologize in advance. You're a fucking asshole. Uh, you can cut that out if you need to. <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> all right. You're an asshole and you don't even know what your real job is and you need to get the fuck out of the sport because you're, you're a pariah on what we do. You, you make what I do, the art that what I do, the art of what I teach my people, you make us look bad and you then you, you, you push other people away that could be getting help. Shame on you. So that's the first thing. Uh, this, the second thing is the lifestyle. So if we don't teach balance and we don't teach seasons, people fall in love with seasons. What do I mean by that? So when I got really, really lean, I fell in love with that, that look. So that means I fell in love with that process. And that process was one of constriction, a process of like, over-evaluating how I look too much, uh, over-training, um, and, and then doing whatever fat burners or whatever I was doing at the time, because this is a long time ago, to keep that look. Well, that's what caused all my gut issues because those things hurt your gut. And women try to stay lean all the time. You, you have to go through seasons. You have to go through a season of eating more and a season of eating less, a, se a season of training more, of training less. We're, we're so... Um, can, we're such habit forming and we fall in love with one season. It's like how often, how many times I'm sure in Canada, you guys deal with this. It's like you get, you fall in love with summer. It's there for a couple months and then you got to go through this winter phase. It's pretty long up there. Yeah. And <laughs> you're probably like, Oh, I can't stand this. But then you'll have maybe your, your holidays in the winter. And there's certain aspects of winter that are beautiful that you can appreciate but if you, you know, but for the body, if you do that, if you stay in one season all the time, your body adapts to that. And when it adapts to that, that's what causes problems. And that's why women, one uh, uh, out of every three women will actually be fatter from fitness than healthier because they try to fall in love with the season and the things that they do to their body to stay lean all the time messes up their metabolisms and then they're overweight the rest of their life because of it. And that's something that the fitness industry needs to own. I think the, the third thing has to do with dietary um, ideas. So just because research says that protein's good for you for building muscle for 12 weeks, doesn't mean protein should be high all the time. The number one tool to health is not high protein, it's diet variation. And if anybody tells you any different, they don't know what they're talking about. Uh, uh, protein is great for building muscle. Protein is a great nutrient, uh, has lots of nutrients in it and is a great resource. But if you don't rotate that, you actually get less efficient at using protein appropriately. Many people you will find, particularly if you're doing, for me, if I put people into anaerobic activity long-term with cardio, the responsibility actually becomes in carbohydrates, not proteins. Unless I've got them on keto for a little while, but you have to even be careful there. So, People fall in love with just high protein. You don't want to do that with women all the time. It's not good for their digestion. It's not good for their hormones. It doesn't mean you don't have 
lots of protein at different times. It just needs, you need to vary that. Uh, and that actually, it, it strips the fiber out of the gut. So they don't get enough fiber in because their primary um, macro is protein. Um, you know, not to mention the fat context, we don't take fats into account. So if you're eating high protein, low fat, um, and you're, and so your primary fat ends up becoming saturated fat. And this is why a lot of bodybuilders die young. I mean, the number, I don't know if anybody knows this, but I hate to tell you bodybuilders, I love you guys. You're my family, but we die 10 years earlier. So do you tell me how the fitness industry is healthier? If we die 10 years earlier than most people, how's that? Now, if you're just in fitness and you're just an enjoyable bodybuilding and you're just trying to stay healthy, you live a lot longer, a lot more vibrant. There's a lot more to it. But if you go hardcore in the paint with bodybuilding, your, your life is 10 years shorter. So enjoy that. Um, and, and then, and then I, I would say that the last thing is we don't take into account a woman's hormonal complexity. We diet women like small men because the, the field of research, the field of medicine, the field of fitness, they're all male dominated fields. And there has not been enough emphasis on what needs to be done, particularly to a woman to respect her hormonal complexity so that we don't injure her when we try dieting her through like a, like a small male. And those would be some of the keys. And those are just some of them that need to change about the fitness industry. If we're going to be any use to the rest of the population, who's not hardcore fitness. And I want to come back to, um, I think you said like they diet, they uh, prep like women, like small, uh, like small male. And a lot of times in the industry, people are going to prep their uh, women as a, the same as their male. So I think you, you have some clients in the, in the competition prep, right? Oh, I have lots. Yeah. I just, yeah. so my, so I don't, what you guys have to understand is you probably don't even know all my platforms. I don't want to cut off. So I have about 50 different IFBB pros, uh, some natural, some, you know, whatever, WBFF or whatever. But a lot of them, I'm the hormone coach or I'm the assistant coach. Some I'm the head coach. And I don't put them all on my page because some of them work for teams that we have, we have relationships where I don't want people to think I'm taking people's client. It's just, it makes it easier for someone to refer me a client. And then also, um, the other reason is, is I don't want to scare away the average person. If my page was just full with prep clients, then, then the average woman at home that I really want to help um, get with one of my coaches is going to think, oh, well, all they do is prep coaching. And it's not true. But we do everything here from make champions to help people get uh, fertile, to overcome prediabetes, to, to uh, overcoming the worst autoimmune diseases in the world. There's nothing we can't do. You can't put me in the box. I do it all. There's nothing I don't do the best. And that's my attitude going into anything, which every coach should have that attitude. But I, you know, I take that attitude. I'm the best in the world and I can do anything. And uh, that's kind of how I approach that. <laughs> that's perfect. That's a, that's All of us should. You should have that too. I would, I would applaud you. Like, you know, like I'm the best. No, I'm the best. That's great. That's healthy, right? Like I love, I, I support that. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's exactly the mindset we have here. We always try to be the best and put the most content out there that we think is going to help our clients and the fitness community in Quebec yeah. and yeah. soon maybe all over Canada. We'll that's see. right. There's a huge and, opportunity there in Canada. Canada's yeah. our, one of our fastest going countries because we're in multiple countries. We're pretty popular in Australia, uh, the UK, um, Mexico. Um, but Canada is probably our number one growing demographic. And you guys have the best opportunity out there. Your people need you because I, and again, I don't want this to get political, but the single payer system that you guys have, the government pay uh, structure you have for medicine there makes it hard to get access to anything. My Canadian clients suffer the most because when you, when, when care is paid for by the government, you're forced down certain routes. And so the only way to get outside of that is to get someone outside the medical system. Well, guess who that is? That's a coach. That's you, you know? Oh, definitely. It, just like you said, you, we have to wait for years and years before we even see a doctor if we have something like that's bigger than just a uh, normal. Uh... Uh, and again, I don't think the American system, so I don't want people thinking that I'm like all like the American system's great. I just, my clients in Canada suffer so much to alternative access. I, it is unbelievable. Uh, I just, I feel for them so bad. We have to sneak them things into the country 
to try to get them stuff, just some, some basic supplements that they don't govern, the government doesn't even allow. And then they try to like control my shipments and I got to try to sneak things in there just to try to get them some, some of the things that they absolutely need to make this work. It's, I, I get it from the outside looking in, you guys, I, you guys got a real raw deal when it comes to that right now. And I, I love my Canadian clients. I love, can, listen, Canada is like one of my favorite countries. I have not met a person from Canada. I don't like, uh, and that's pretty hard to say. And I just feel my heart break sometimes with the cases that we get. And then no one will take their case and no one will listen. There's the waiting lines. It's like, dude, I just, I, my heart breaks. I don't want to make it political or anything. I'm just telling you my first person experience. Right. No, definitely, man. Because I think a few years back, I was, I want to say 18 years old, and I, I've always been like a little shaky with my hands. So I went to see that doctor, and he said, Well, check your thyroid if it's like either higher or whatever. And he said, If it's, uh, if you have like hypothyroidism, we'll put you on meds to boost it a little bit. But I was like, Man, like, what? I'm 18 years old. Do you see what I'm saying? Like indoctrinating you and they don't even know that's what they're doing, man. Like that doctor really thought he was doing the right thing. And that yeah. just shows you how insane medicine can get from group think. Group think is the scariest thing that can ever happen to a, a, a patient and alternatives that can be available because the idea that you just need thyroid replacement. My next YouTube video drop, because I'm doing long form, anybody shameless plug, my new YouTube is going to be Metabolic Mentor. I'm going to teach everybody that, that blend between fitness and then how medical has gotten where it has and where things intersect. Because I take you through a history, a full history of how thyroid research has come about. And the, the, like Canada, for example, the labs they run in Canada for thyroid, for the most part, were developed in 1920. Right after they discovered thyroiodine in like thyroid tissue. And so they came up with TSH, uh, T, uh, T3 reflex, and total T4 thyroxin. And they still use that same test today in Canada, designed in 1920. And then all they do is decide whether they're going to give you replacement therapy or not. And there's not, when you realize how much there is to do now on thyroid, it is, it is almost unethical. It is almost, negligible to continue just to, to continue to only have those two routes um and i you know that's what happens when the government controls medicine i'm sorry i just it's unfortunate yeah. and we talked a little bit about uh, meta me uh, metabolism and i'd like to you uh, to explain a little bit more what it is because i feel like some people think metabolism is just like this little organ inside of us that you put <laughs> you put calories and it magically starts working right yeah so. yeah so to understand metabolism there's two things we're going to talk about one is i want you to think of metabolism as packaging so who you know anyone i want you to think of an assembly line and I want you to think that there might be something that goes into the box and then there's the, the cardboard for the box. And then there's um, the, maybe the wrap that goes on the box and maybe a bow that goes on the box and a down assembly line, all those ingredients come together to make something new. You're, it's, it's the same thing of taking somebody, if you take a gift, if you take a gift and then you turn it into a present, like whatever the gift is, like let's say it's a skateboard, sorry. And then you turn it into a present, you've just made it something new. So the process of metabolism in many ways is, is that, meaning you're converting things into other things, you're, whether you're converting it uh, to energy, whether you're using energy to convert an enzyme or, or secrete a chemical, enzymatic relationships, um, the process of conversion. So the speed at which, at which a cell does that is your metabolism. And it creates outcomes. Like uh, in that process of metabolizing, you now have to understand the second term, which is like the law of thermodynamics, which does play a part. The busier a cell is, the more it metabolizes, usually the more heat it releases. So there's, there's the heat released from a dynamic system. Like say your computer stays on too long, right? Your computer isn't moving. So how is it heating up, right? Well, that's because of the current that's occurring through it, through its activity internally. Uh, 
the, the, the computer will heat up. That's a law of thermodynamics. So it's releasing excess heat, but then it's also doing work. Now, a computer theoretically isn't necessarily doing physical work, but your, your human body does, meaning it moves. Um, there are components inside a computer that do move. Don't get me wrong. But um, so your body's moving, metabolizing, and releasing heat. And the rate at which you do that and the rate at which you produce energy really have everything to do with your metabolic rate. So the rate at which you produce energy and the rate at which you burn it and burning it through activity, internal activity, uh, resting activity, release of heat and movement, okay? And so at the rate at which those are happening, kind of to a certain degree dictates your metabolic rate, your exchange. And you can, you can measure that through the exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide too. There's, a, you know, there's different ways to evaluate this energy expenditure but your metabolism isn't in one place. So you can't point to your metabolism. It's in every cell of your body. Now, some cells burn more energy than others. Usually the cells that have more mitochondria in them, that would be like your brain, your heart, liver, kidneys. These areas tend to burn more calories. So you can imagine, all right, so you've got these coaches that say CICO. What does that mean? That means calories in, calories out. So the, the, the dynamic state of the machine that I just described, you should know the inputs that you put in that machine. You should know how much energy it's going to burn and then how much heat it's going to release. So you should know exactly the rate of loss of that machine, right? Like if it's at a net de deficit. So if the machine burns more energy than it, you gave it, it should then lose weight, right? If we're talking about a human body. And, and while that's true, everything's changing. I just did a, I do a series uh, where I speak across the country and I talk about what's called redefining BMR, um, looking at basal metabolic rate, meaning what do you burn when you're just at rest? So if I'm at rest, there's heat coming off of me and my body's functionally uh, metabolizing internally. So there's this resting energy rate, but that resting energy rate, we, we try to define into a calculation based on like age, muscle, all kinds of different things. The reality is based on how optimal that system is, is what's going to dictate whether you can measure it in a calculation as well as you'd like. And most human beings today, this is why functional medicine is so important. Functions get off. And the best way to describe it is, let's say your body's on a metabolic axis. Like the earth is on a 20 degree tilt. And that's the earth's axis. And if that axis even gets off one degree, you know, the oceans would overflow. There'd be all kinds of symptoms on the earth to represent how the axis gets off. You're, you have a metabolic axis that also dictates how efficient your system works. That axis is dictated by a series of hormones that are both either amino acid hormones, peptide hormones. So like amino acid hormones are like thyroxin, peptide hormones are like HCG, right? Um, insulin, and then you have your lipid hormones, which are like uh, your sex hormones. So testosterone, estrogen, things like that. Leptin is also, a, I think, a, a peptide hormone. So imagine that they're all in alignment and they're all working correctly. If they're all working correctly, then the calculation of the machine will work. And all you got to do is follow some macros, work out a certain amount, follow your calculations on your MyFitnessPal, and everything's going to work out great. But as time goes on and inflammation goes up, hormones get imbalanced, your, your, your tilt on your axis gets off. And now your system becomes less efficient. Leptin gets a little insensitive, cortisol gets off, thyroid gets off a little bit, sex hormones get off a little bit. And they're all on an axis and they all help each other stabilize. And when they're all off, nothing's stable anymore. Majority of Americans, whether they sit on their butt at home and overeat, or they overtrain in fitness without proper guidance, they do the same imbalancing to their body. So they both have problems. There are some studies that show seven out of 10 people have some form of hormonal imbalance. So my friend, I'm speaking to you, being in the fitness field, how are we going to continue to use standard nutrition models that are based on optimal 
metabolic axis is when majority of our lifestyle clients do not have optimal metabolic rates and axes. That's why functional medicine comes into play because it feeds and balances and restores the body back to a metabolic axis that makes it optimal so that the standard nutrition fitness methods work again. That's why it's going to be, if you don't know functional nutrition, you are going to be left out in the next five to 10 years because everyone's going to have a problem. People are starting to diet themselves at 10 years old. They're coming in, they're getting exposed to toxins more than ever. They're eating the wrong foods more than ever. They're under eating and starving themselves more than ever, or they're overeating themselves together. They're staying at home. The idea that there's going to be a normal person walking around that just wants to get a little bit more fit. And there's going to be enough people to, su to support a whole fat, juicy fitness industry is total BS. And because <clears throat> if we use those calculations for like uh, what calories you should eat, if you want to lose weight and all that stuff, it never takes into account what the person is doing when they come to see you, right? So some clients are like, let's say 250 pounds. And if you use those calculations, the, the amount of calories they should, they, they should eat to lose weight would be like, I don't know, 2000 or something like that. But sometimes they eat like maybe 1300 12. calories a day. 12, yeah, so, yeah, yeah. So if so you, you put them like 2000 calories, they'll never eat it and they'll just gain weight and you got it. You got it. So you have to learn how to, how do we prime the metabolisms? How do we get? So I talk about that in, in one, in two terms. I talk about BMR potential and BMR actual. So let's say somebody's calculated BMR um, comes out to, you know, 1600 calories. And then their activity multiplier puts them at somewhere at, you know, DEE, which is daily energy expenditure, which is activity on top of your resting metabolic rate. So let's say you're somewhere in the neighborhood of night, you know, let's, let's, let's just say 2000. So based on those calculations, you should be able to lose weight on anything under 2000 calories. The reality is though, is most people have been over under eating hormones are off and then starving themselves too many times that you have to get them so far down um, that you end up now nutrient depleting them, eating too much muscle. So every time that they diet, their metabolic rate declines because you're not doing it optimally. So then the reality is, even though you can calculate their basal metabolic rate, and I don't even care, I don't even find VO2 max to be that accurate. I'm going to be honest with you. Um, it's nice for a, just a snapshot. But so, you know, let's say every time you diet, you probably lose. Well, let's do this number. Every pound of muscle you lose, you burn 50 less calories per hour of moderate activity. That could be shoveling snow or raking or whatever. So still the key, the, the number one biomarker of health today is still muscle. And that goes for medical or fitness. And so if you eat too much muscle because you're trying to rush a process or you're just under eating and you're not dieting correctly, that's muscle that most normal people aren't going to get back because their hormones aren't gonna come back right. So they keep, every time they diet themselves, they dig themselves a bigger hole for a worse and worse metabolism, which is why most women in their thirties are overweight. It's not because of anything else other than how America, how we've been dieting ourselves. Remember, we did not have these weight issues 50 years ago, 70 years ago. Now there are other reasons for that too. But the number one change is diet systems. People 70 years ago started dieting themselves really irregularly. I believe it is the unnatural dieting that causes our number one reason for weight gain later. Not our bad eating, not our inactivity, not all the other stuff they want to tell you. Now, there is medications and toxins and other things to take into account that have made it way worse. You can talk about birth control too, because that, you know in the last 70 years, birth control has come heavy, right? Uh, 70 years ago, only 40% of women were, that were birthing age were on birth controls. Now, 98% have been on birth control at one time. So don't tell me that that's not played a part too. But one in three women have slow metabolisms today. How did that happen overnight? Think about when you were a kid. How many overweight people did you see? Canada is even better than the United States. But how many did you see? 
Not many. Right. How did it happen? I'm only 37 and I didn't see any overweight people at 12, maybe a couple. It, it's not just because of bad food. We've had processed food for much longer than 20 years. But you know what's become really popular is dieting yourself. So I think the fitness industry is the number one problem. I'm sorry. You could say fitness diet industry. I think it's the number one problem. I, I think we think it's our, it's, our, it's our answer and I think it's our problem. And that's why it could be the best thing in the world with great coaches such as yourself and your team and others. But in the wrong hands, it's disastrous. And I don't know if it, you need any uh, certification in uh, the United States to be a trainer, but here it's pretty much, let's say tomorrow, I want to be a personal trainer. I just go online on Instagram. I write personal trainer in my bio and I can start taking clients, right? There is yeah. nothing stopping me to do that. So that's like the biggest problem here. I feel like, I, I mean, at the same time, it's great for us because it's like, you know, what, uh, the good coaches are and who the bad ones are, but still some people are going to go see the bad coach first because they're, they're because they're, they're going to evaluate coaching based on price. Yeah, or they're, and, and they're looks. When you don't hire someone to direct your ship in life at a discount, ever, don't go to the person that's $5 to tell you how to run your life. They don't even know how to run theirs. That's why they're charging $5. You know what I mean? Like people don't realize that. And then they get into these bad behaviors and patterns. Like coaches, the word coach should be special. And it's not. And that's a sacred position in somebody's life. And a lot of people who just want to get a job that either look good or they just need something to do, they slap that word on themselves. And I'm not saying you don't need to get your start somewhere. Don't get me wrong, because I was there too. But I was empowered with a lot of the wrong information. And I regurgitated that dumb shit to a lot of other people. And it hurt them early in my career. Uh, and that's why I don't want the government telling us what to do though. I don't want that. That's why I created a university. That's why I'm going to, I'm going to create a, a, a culture change. I'm going to bring about awareness because I want us to self govern. I don't want the government coming in and telling us what's good and what's not because some of our best ideas come from outside the box, you know? And so if you look, look what's happened with the medical system, there is no outside the box. You're either in or you're out. And, and then it stifles all opportunity for, for other therapies. Do you understand what I'm saying? Um, so you don't want the government telling you what you can and can't do. But you do need to have an industry that is self-controlled, that has things in place to help for awareness and, and help get people the right resources and educate them and empower them. So they can make the best decisions as free people themselves. That's what has to happen. Hey, listen, you're free. If you want to take an idiot coach and do that, but guess what? God bless you. You're free. You know what I mean? You can do whatever you want to do, but you're going to learn the hard way, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes they pay the price like really badly. So yeah, I know. So. Well, this has been and, great, man. It's awesome. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's so many things I wanted to talk about, but I mean, we only have so much time right in the day. So yeah. yeah. But, well, you can have me back later. Don't worry. Oh, definitely, man. We'll have to get you back on the podcast because sure. you know so many things. Your knowledge is just out of this world. So uh, <laughs> I really appreciate you taking time out of your day for the podcast with us. And uh, where can people find you on social media? That's great. So yeah, so if you're interested in, in the uh, work that we're doing, my, my career is taking a turn. It used to be that all I did was practice all day. I had like 250 clients and, and now I keep a very small client base and what we're working on is awareness. So if anyone listens to this and it is, you know, kind of um, if, if what I said spoke to you at all, if, if it empowered you at all, um, I, I need your support. Um, the, the ideas that I'm presenting are quite radical and a lot, I meet a lot of resistance. And so you can show that support by, um, checking out my Instagram, Vince underscore pit stick, or my company nutrition underscore dynamic on Instagram. You can go to my new mentor page, 
on YouTube because that's where my long form content is going to go. Um, it's a metabolic mentor. If you're interested in becoming certified, if you want to know the secrets to how to solve any condition on the planet and do it through a fitness program, um, we have the resources to empower you and so you can help others. Um, so you can send us an email at uh, vincentnutritiondynamic.com and my team can meet with you and walk you through our private university. Um, it, we also have our E3 podcast with Erica Fitlove. You know, she was the um, trainer on the, on the Biggest Loser. And then um, uh, we're going we're gonna to be coming out with a lot more uh, materials, eBooks, things like that, more to get awareness out there. So uh, more, more than anything, I, I, you know, whether you buy anything from me or not, just share the content, show some support because I've been, you know, championing this position uh, for about 15 years and, and it just started coming on strong in the last two or three. And that's only because people are rallying around me and through your collective support, we can make a real change. And that's my, that's my hope. Great. All right, man. Thank you so much. And uh, All right. Thanks have a, a wonderful lot. day. We'll see you again. See ya. Bye.